Hey everybody, Ed Homewood, Old Guy Hi-Fi Channel. I hope you're all doing well today. Today I wanted to do a quick video. I made a change in my system and in, in my playlist, obviously there's, I talk about, you know, what my current system is and uh, some updates and things like that that I've done to it. Um, as most of you know, I do own a pair of ELAC Debut 2.0 F62 floor staining speakers, which I really do enjoy. And I was just kind of looking for something different, try to get a different feel for things. And what I did was I went into the other room where we have our workout equipment and I brought in my original pair of reference speakers from 1988. Uh, and I just wanted to give them a listen again. I, you know, listened to them on the treadmill, but I'm not paying much attention. And these were my standard. These were my reference for years and years and years. And I was using them with a big old Harman Kardon receiver, which I'm going to do a video on later. Um, and Somehow I got to satisfy the sound. You know how we are as, as audio files and kind of gearhead knuckleheads. Um, I just, I crave something new and that's why I bought the Elax. And I'm not, I don't necessarily regret buying the Elax. Uh, after re-listening to these and letting them break in again, because if a speaker sits for a very long time and it's years that they weren't really played, you need to break them in again. And I did. Now that I've done that, I'm almost wondering what am I going to do with my Elax now? Because these things are amazing. So let's talk about them. The speaker is made by a company called Energy. They were a division of a company called API Audio Products International out of Scarborough, Ontario, Canada. And when we had the store here in Chicago, we were an Energy dealer. Now, Energy started out originally at making basically one speaker called the 22 Pro. And it came out of a development project at the Canadian NRC and Dr. Floyd Toole, the famous uh, loudspeaker designer and engineer. And so the 22 Pro, as it was called, and if you go online, you'll see it. And I may be able to insert a picture somewhere in here, although I'm not very good at editing. Um, it was used as a studio reference and a reference speaker at the NRC and for measuring equipment and doing all kinds of other things. It was a wonderful product. And they developed a whole new tweeter uh, for that, which was unique. And we're going to talk about it in a second because this has an evolution of that tweeter in it. So Energy was a, a good sized company in Canada. They were kind of had a great reputation for building, you know, a really good sounding speaker. So they wanted to expand into the North American market, into the U.S. primarily. And so they came out with a whole new line of speakers that included these. They, they, this was the 22 series, as carryover from the 22 Pro. And then they had another series called the number three, let's say, dot one lowercase e. And those were more of an entry level kind of speaker system, you know, kind of on the lines of a, of a Boston Acoustics or, an, you know, Basic Infinity or the advent under the Jensen speaker company, you know, for years. So that was kind of a mid-priced, you know, not really entry level, but mid-priced. And then they had the 22 series, which was their top line product. Now these in 1988 were $1,700, I believe, and I'll put what that is equal to now, inflation adjusted. So they were on the upper end. 1700 bucks is a lot of money. And in the stores, in our flagship store, in our primary main listening room, this is what we used as a reference speaker to uh, judge and evaluate equipment, to compare amplifiers, preamplifiers, CD players, turntables, everything, because it is so revealing. Um, and so I've had these since 1988. I love them to death. And we'll talk about how they're built because they are unique. The cabinets are incredibly inert. This bad boy weighs 45 pounds. And you can see it's got an integrated metal stand that is filled. Um, and it's actually filled with MDF and it's glued in place. Um, so it's really inert. Um, and it's actually screwed, hard screwed into the base of the speaker itself. Um, so very inert, very excellent. Now it's leaned back a little bit because you get a good wide dispersion pattern because it's not super tall like the Elax are. Um, but what's interesting about this, in addition to the drivers, we'll talk about that, is this baffle material. It's called Spherex. And Spherex is a polymer material that is impregnated with little glass micro beads. So it is super inert, very inert. It actually hurts my knuckle. Um, but also, too, because it is that kind of a material, they can mold it and they can make it the shape they wanted it to. So, you know, nice molded flared port area. You'll notice that it's hard to see where you are. There's a big lip here on the speaker because it curves away so that there is no baffle diffraction off of this thing, even though it's a seven inch woofer. So very clean that way. And then the tweeter area. Now this is a replacement tweeter and we'll talk about that. You'll notice it, maybe you hopefully you can see it says energy 22, but then this side is a different molding different shape. It's a concave shape, excuse me, not concave, but it, it, it rolls off. And the, and the other speaker is a mirror image of this. So it'll be 22 on this side and then the, the curve on this side. And the reason is with the original tweeter, which mounted flush with this, 
you've got, they got a 210 degree uh, 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 spread of frequency. So it actually went more than 180. And the idea behind that was for imaging. And it, it, these things image amazingly well, even with the non-standard tweeter in it. Um, so really, really great. So I had to replace the tweeter because after so many years of owning it, um, I believe that the ferrofluid in the tweeter voice coils dried up and I burned a voice coil, and unfortunately. So this is the actual tweeter itself. It's known as the dual hyperdome tweeter or in Energy's marketing material, the million dollar tweeter. And it's an evolution of the original tweeter for the 22.2. You'll notice in the center, it's got a small dome and that's actually the tweeter itself. And they'll play up to 23,000 uh, Hertz. And then around the outside, same material, same silk, but it's got a little bit of a waveform and it actually acts as a bit of a mid-range driver. So this can play uh, authoritatively down below 1500 Hertz. The crossover point was 1500 Hertz. But so it was kind of a two and a quarter way or two and a third way, something like that. Um, so it actually was really unique. So super wide dispersion. Again, the ability to play really solid down to about 1500 cycles. And it, there's no human voices down there, obviously, not much. But piano, violin, things like that sounded super smooth and super sweet. Um, anyway, I burned a voice coil. There was a guy in Nova Scotia who bought the, the tooling from Energy when they got bought by Klipsch. Um, and he supposedly could redo the voice coils. 150 bucks a tweeter. I reached out to him, I don't know, probably three or four times a year for 10 years and never heard anything back from him. So I don't know what ever happened, but you can see the magnet structure on this thing is ginormous. It's really a monster tweeter. So it went south on me, couldn't find a replacement. Uh, I couldn't get a direct replacement. So I had to kind of get creative and come up with something myself. So this is a Tang tweeter. It is a ceramic dome tweeter, but it has a silk uh, surround to it. Um, it is a one inch and it's kind of a bullet shape because it's, it's an enclosed on the back. Now it has a free air resonance of 700 Hertz. So now I'm safe taking this thing down to 1500 cycles, even with a fair amount of power, and it'll play all the way out to 30,000 cycles. So really a good range tweeter. Um, also too, it had to fit a one inch hole. So that was kind of another thing that was part of it. Um, these were, I think, 45 bucks a piece or something from Dayton Audio. They work really well. They don't make them anymore, unfortunately. But anyway, so with this tweeter and this woofer, we have a frequency response of literally 3B, 3 dB down, 25 Hertz on the low end, up to 30 Hertz, plus or minus 3 dB on the top end. So really good frequency response, really good uh, integration between the two. But again, a full 25 Hertz at 3 dB down. And I'm not kidding you, these things drop bombs. They make bass. But it's not too much, it's not boomy, it's really articulate. And the reason for that is this seven inch woofer. This is called a quad-centric woofer. Um, it uses a, a unique material, unique uh, polypropylene material that is super light, not immensely rigid like you would think a metal dome is. It's got a little bit of a give to it, but, and it uses a, an inverted butyl rubber surround, which means instead of the surround coming out, it goes in. So it's concave and I, you won't be able to see it, but I'll give you a close up of it when it, cause I'm gonna take the woofer out and show you the crossover. It is, the surround is stitched to the woofer cone. Now, the reason that uh, Energy said they did that was that gave them a more flexible bond between the, the butyl rubber surround and the cone itself. And rather than a hard glue rigid bond, which could then make that edge of the cone stiff and more prone to breakups. What I heard, the rumor I heard was this was a unique material and no one had a glue that could properly glue the butyl rubber and have it stay attached to this material for any period of time. So in addition to, there is glue on there. In addition to that, they stitched it to hold it together. I don't know how true that is. All I do know is these things sound amazing. And literally, I don't use my big definitive technology subwoofer when I play them. Um, they play low and they play articulate with texture and excellent sound. So that's the energy speakers. And again, this was part of a lineup, three speakers in the 22 reference series, a floor standard, this, and a bookshelf, and then their standard entry level speakers. Unfortunately, I don't know how many, we sold a ton of them here in Chicago. Um, and we use this as our reference speakers. Um, but you don't, you just don't see them come up uh, used anymore. I've seen some on, Audio gun. I've seen some of the 22 Pros come up, um, but I think the biggest issue is the tweeters all went on them. Um, you know, despite the million dollars they spent on it over the years, ferrofluid, which is a cooling material that lives in the gap 
where the voice coil, you know, between the magnet and the voice coil, it's a, it is a kind of a freon based or like Teflon based liquid material with small iron uh, filings in it that help dissipate heat away from the very delicate and small voice coil of a tweeter. I think the ferrofluid, you know, dries up on them and they get too hot and then you wind up losing a voice coil because the windings on these things are almost, you know, human hair uh, diameter. So that's the, uh, the Energy 22-2s. Um, I'm going to go ahead and reset. We're going to pull the woofer out. Actually, I'll show you the back of the speaker first, and I'll pull the woofer out because on the back, you'll see there's actually an L-pad uh, volume control, and it's for the tweeter because the tweeter was way more efficient than the woofer. They're both 6 ohms, but this was way more efficient than the woofer. The, the whole speaker with the original tweeter was 86 dB, um, which is, means that's what this woofer is, and they toned down the tweeter. So this is a 90 dB. So I had to get something in between the, the tweeter and the mid ray and the crossover that I can actually adjust the level of the tweeter to get it to b blend better with the woofer. And I did, but that's, you'll see that on the backside. So I'm going to go ahead and reset. Thank you so much. Okay. Here we are on the backside of the speaker. And as you can see, there's that uh, uh, L pad there for the tweeter. And then the uh, cup, dual binding post cup. So by wired, I replaced the by wire strap the strap material with uh, some real speaker materials and then you can see the data plate for the speaker so that's the back side of the speaker and then we're going to pull the woofer out and i'll show you the crossover okay as promised there's a look at that woofer and hopefully you can see that stitched edge right there in the quad centric woofer now it's nothing special it's a standard stamp steel basket it's very nicely made um, it is made in Canada. It's not an imported product. So very nicely constructed. Now we're going to go and take a look inside the speaker itself at the crossover network. Now above that circular thing, the silver circular thing is the L pad that I've added, but you can see it's a fairly decent crossover. I mean, Danny Ritchie at GR Research would say it's probably cheesy parts and whatever, but oh my God, does this thing sound really, really good. So anyway, that's a look inside. You can see the bracing is quite substantial along with all of the, uh, the dampening material, batting material. So very, very well constructed. So let me reset and we're going to do a finalize on these. So what are my final thoughts about these? Um, again, I bought these in 1988 knowing it was without question, one of the finest speakers I'd ever heard at any price. And I've had and been, ex been exposed to some phenomenally expensive speakers. Um, I am a bit of a two way guy. I like two ways. I obviously had these for 30 plus years. Um, and I think the difference between these and the Elex, the Elex are a really good speaker. The Elex um, are smooth. They're, they have good detail. They're decent on the top end, although they're a bit rolled off without question. Um, Base wise, they do okay. They don't dig as deep as these do, even though they've got three six inch woofers on it. And I think a lot of that is that was a speaker built to a budget. This was a speaker without consideration for a budget, maybe a price point, but not really budgeted like the Elex were. Uh, you know, uh, there has been some talk that Andrew Jones's budget to build the debut 2.0 was just ridiculously low from Elex. Um, and he built a great speaker, and I do enjoy him, but. I've put these back in. I've let them run in for several days um, to break in. Uh, I'm using the Cambridge amp now when prior to that, I was using a big Harman Kardon AV receiver, which I'm going to be doing a review on uh, in the next couple of days. The guys show you something you will not believe. Uh, an absolute, I mean, it is a supercharged, turbocharged, freaking V8 of an amplifier, this thing for an AV receiver. Uh, it will do in excess of 200 watts a channel, all five channels driven. So it's amazing, but you'll see that. But I used that for years. And obviously the Harman's got a different sound signature than the Cambridge. The Cambridge is very warm, um, really good detailed and articulate bass. Uh, the Harman had that as well. And obviously when you see the size of the power supply and everything else, it had tremendous control over the bass. The Cambridge comes super close to it, um, I must say. Now, the Harman gets a little harsher up th through the mid-range up to the high frequencies. Harsh isn't maybe the right word. Maybe a little bit more forward, a little more aggressive, a little more spicy, to use a John Darko quote, um, where the Cambridge is very smooth through the mid-range, very, I mean, just a smidge warm. And then 
the high frequencies, while they may appear at first glance to be rolled off, they are not. They are extended and very nice. And especially with a speaker like this, it can go out to 30,000 cycles. I think those high frequencies are allowed to really develop their, their you know, full potential. I can't hear above 12,000 cycles. I've had my hearing checked, but there's not much information up there other than harmonics for the most part. Um, and I think at about 12 to 15,000 cycles is where all the air and the sense of space and the, the sound of the room and those kinds of things uh, live anyway. And I don't think there's much beyond that. Actually, during the early days of hi-fi and stereo, uh, most manufacturers you know, we're quoting up to 15,000 cycles as frequency responses because they, they, you know, it was pretty much assumed no one could hear that high. I don't know of anybody that can hear to 20,000 cycles. In my youth and when I was doing this all the time, uh, in the old days, they were on CRT TV, CRT tube TVs. There was a thing called a flyback transformer on the tube itself. And that had a, that buzzed at 15,600 cycles. And I could hear that. I could hear fluorescent lights in the room. I still can, and most people can too, because that's a much lower frequency. But anything much beyond 15,000 cycles is really just going to be harmonics at best. And these do a, a great job. So now, as I said, do I regret buying Elex? I don't. They're great speakers. Do I think I'm going to put the Elex back into the system right away? I don't think so. I think I'm going to listen to these for a while. They are really smooth. They're a little bit more extended on the top end than the Elex. Uh, their base is amazing. I don't need to use my subwoofer with them. Uh, and their imaging is just staggering. Um, I hear stuff way out to the to either side. Through the middle, it's very, it goes just behind the speakers and it goes deep. Um, instruments aren't super placed in exact spots in space. I mean, you can sense where they are. And I think that's kind of a function of the Cambridge not having the most absolutely precise imaging location. But Cambridge has a deep sound stage, and the speakers do a very good job with that. Um, the Cambridge can do really wide as these can as well. And sometimes I'll get sounds out almost, you know, parallel with my ears without doing my Hafler surround sound system, which there's a video on that in my in, in the uh, playlist. Um, and so I'm really, really amazed and and really kind of surprised coming back to these after so many years of not listening to them to really find out that whatever flaw I thought they had, I, it was me. It wasn't the speakers, it was me. I just, maybe I just wanted to buy something new and that might've been it. Well, anyway, if you guys have any questions about the energy speakers or any of the stuff in my system or anything I talk about in any of my videos, please don't hesitate in putting them in the comments. As most of you will know, if you have commented, I will reply. Um, I, I wanna have, create an interaction with you guys. Um, if you have suggestions for videos or, you know, I just did a, a video on classical music for rock fans. If there's something else, maybe I'm thinking about doing a, a jazz music, you know, jazz for rock fans or um, maybe rock for classical fans. I don't know. I think that's where I want to go. I'm, I, I'm not going to do product reviews. Uh, there's too many people doing that. It's a, and it's a fairly populated space. So I want to do something more unique. Um, again, my philosophy is, is the music comes first. What can I do to make the music enjoyable? I enjoy it on my Elex. I really enjoy it on these. I enjoy it on my Sennheiser Drop 6XX headphones too. But it's the music that comes first. Um, so anyway, leave me a comment. Uh, please give me a like and subscribe. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you guys so much. I'm Ed, the old guy, Hi-Fi Channel, and I'll talk to you later. Thanks.